In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, Amen. My Lord and my God, I firmly believe that you are here, that you see me, that you hear me. I adore you with profound reverence. I ask your pardon for my sins and the grace to make this time of prayer fruitful. My Immaculate Mother, St. Joseph, my Father and Lord, my Guardian Angel, intercede for me. As you know, we have just uh, finished uh, the Easter season, which ended with the solemnity of Pentecost, when the Holy Spirit comes and, and uh, fires up the apostles in the Seneca. Uh, before, they were afraid and doubtful, and now they are on fire and ready to undertake the mission. And so now is what we call the time of the church, which we also call now the season of ordinary time. It's ordinary time, not because it's ordinary in the sense of being boring or ordinary in the sense of being unappealing or dull. When we say something is ordinary, we say it's ordinary in the sense that it's very normal. But, but when we speak of ordinary we speak of the habitual action of God in the church in the world. Right? The church in the world. The ordinary action of God using the church to act. And that's why we are in ordinary time. And the color of ordinary time is green, as you can see here in the tabernacle veil. And, of course, there are solemnities also in ordinary time special feasts that are outside of the Easter season, outside even of the season of uh, Advent. And these solemnities are Trinity Sunday, the Solemnity of Corpus Christi next week, and the, the Feast of the Sacred Heart. And those are the three big solemnities. And so tomorrow, or Sunday, this, this Sunday, um, May 30th is the Feast of the Blessed Trinity, or the Solemnity of the Blessed Trinity. So, what does the Church invite us to meditate on, on this feast? Is it perhaps when Jesus explained the Blessed Trinity to the Apostles? Did he talk about the Blessed Trinity? Um, you know, when did it, when was it all explained to the Apostles that God was a unity of substance but three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. When did he explain all that? When did he outline the nature of the Blessed Trinity? Well, we all know, I suppose you know, that the very word Trinity is not in the Gospel. You look through it, you won't find it in the Gospel. That only came later as shorthand for what we see today. And the Gospel that we see today, in, in the Gospel of the Solemnity of the Blessed Trinity is the 11 disciples in the Gospel of St. Matthew, chapter 28. The 11 disciples, they went to Galilee to the mountain to which Jesus had ordered them to go. So they go to this mountain, and when they all saw him, they worshiped. But some doubted, we are told, some doubted. And then Jesus approached and said to them, All power in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. Behold, I'm with you always until the end of the age. I'm with you always. That would have been a very comforting word. But the Gospel does say that while some worshipped, or most of them worshipped, some doubted. They were like, they were doubting. Who doubted? And where did this hesitancy 
come from? Like, why did they doubt? They were seeing Jesus there on the hilltop. Maybe there was a beautiful view. Maybe the sun was setting. So there was just a, a marvelous background. You could see him silhouetted there, maybe with a halo coming forth, his garments shining, and the sound of his voice was strong and confident. And, and his hands extended over his, over his flock in blessing, because he did bless them, like a shepherd, protecting his sheep. And uh, the men around him were absolutely mesmerized with awe, almost fearing lest they say something wrong. But why did some of these doubt at that very powerful moment? What was the problem? What led them to doubt? Well, I don't know exactly why, but I think that my theory is that those who doubted would have, would have remembered Jesus' prayer to the Father when he had, in those intimate moments in the cynical, he would have prayed with them, and he would have prayed to the Father, and he would sigh to the Father, and he would have spoken about how he was preparing the disciples for this mission, and they would have seen his intimate relation with, with God the Father, And they would have perceived something intrinsic about that relationship with the Father and the Spirit. But now, maybe just for a small moment, as he's on the mountaintop, standing there alone, with this kind of powerful look, I would suggest maybe the ghost of the military Messiah was conjured up in some of them. Maybe they thought he's going to tell us now to take up the sword and and conquer the Romans by the sword. This was all the charismatic moment that a military leader would need. But then he he said, go into the whole world, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. (laughs) Then, after he said that, I think at that moment, their doubts disappeared, like they, they vanished. All power in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. Behold, I am with you always until the end of the age. So there was a moment of hesitation and doubt, but then that power was not the power of the sword, but it was the joy of hearing again the word about the Father and the name of the Father and the providence of the Father and the power of the Holy Spirit. And this is the relationship that they had seen so often and and experienced when he was talking with them during the, the public life. And that mysterious hidden spirit that was really the unifying factor to everything that Jesus had been saying all along. And of course, we know the actual word Trinity was not there. But eventually it came about upon further reflection, and probably when he blessed them, he didn't bless them in, with the sign of the cross. Like he didn't do this, right? He probably didn't do that. I doubt it. Maybe, but I don't think so. That came later because the cross was still something that they had to integrate, understand more deeply. But, you know, its salvific meaning, it took time. It took time. But now with those words about the three persons of the Blessed Trinity, the Father, the Son, Holy Spirit, all that hesitancy, all that doubt disappeared, the nervousness that maybe God was some kind of military power. Okay, that's God. So, so God is, is one substance, He's one reality, but He is a communion of love. And some people find that somehow very difficult to understand. They still have this idea of power. God has this unifying power that is completely alone, like a kind of a solitude. Remember that that famous story uh, of St. Patrick with the famous uh, story where he uh, picked up a shamrock leaf and showed it to his friends. And he asked if this was one leaf or if it was three leaves. If you look at shamrock, it kind of looks like three leaves. But it also looks like one leaf, right? And uh, they looked at it and they, they saw that, it well, it was one, but it clearly had three parts. And that's, 
That's how he explained the Blessed Trinity, and that's how doubt disappeared from them. And so he said that God is one God, but in three persons. A simple, a simple image, or perhaps more, perhaps more detailed, is Saint Cyril, who was Saint Cyril, who went to, to the Slavs, Saint Cyril and Methodius. He he translated the Gospel to the Slavs, and he tried to explain the mystery of the Most Blessed Trinity by using the Son, like S U N, the Son, as an example. He said that God the Father is that blazing Sun that we see in the sky. God the Son. The S O N is the light, and God the Holy Spirit is the heat. But there's only one sun, one like one star or the sun. But there are three persons in the Holy Spirit, but one, you know, the one God and one indivisible sun, light, heat. You can't separate light from the heat or or from the sun. It's just like one thing, right? Uh, and that's why on the day of Pentecost, uh, we, the priest is dressed in red because you're not supposed to think of, in this case, not of blood, but of fire and the blazing purifying fire of the Holy Spirit or like those tongues that came upon the apostles to rest on their heads. And they gave off light and fire and understanding and warmth of charity and all the gifts of the Holy Spirit. So, as we prepare for this feast, or this solemnity of the Blessed Trinity, how can we integrate this great mystery? Well, of course, it tells us first that God is not a solitude. That's one of the most important things for us to learn, especially in our time. God is not a solitude. And we need to hear this today in a society that is seeing a kind of an epidemic of solitude, where friendships are fragile, and and uh, all these ways that we have to escape into our own little shells, and go into our rooms, and watch Netflix, and be alone. No, we we are we are really in contact with a God who is not a solitude, but as as the Catechism says, he says, the Catechism says, by sending his only Son and the Spirit of love in the fullness of time, God has revealed his innermost secret. His innermost secret. God himself is an eternal exchange of love. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. He has destined us to share in that exchange. He has destined us to share in that exchange. And this is what we celebrate on Trinity Sunday. God's invitation to an exchange of love. And we have been given access to this secret. So as we pray today, we can tell our Lord in our prayer, I want to have access to that secret but I also want to be part of that secret, that innermost secret of the Blessed Trinity. Like, friends, they, also, they always share secrets. Secrets that they don't tell others. Little secrets, don't tell anybody, but you know, this, I know this secret. But if you're alone, well, you may think you have a secret, but it's not really kept from anyone because you're alone. You're, you know, so secrets are of no use when you're completely alone. And indeed it is true that today friendship is somewhat, I would say, severely in crisis. I would say especially among men. Even older men in particular. And loneliness, it leads to all kinds of health problems, uh, you, know, you know, sort of heart problems, uh, isolation, depression, all kinds of things that make life taxing and difficult. And, you know, when you talk about friendship, they say that male friendships tend to be shoulder to shoulder, right? Side by side, doing things together. Female friendships tend to be face to face, dialoguing, doing stuff, but more like talking intimately and talking together. Men like to do stuff together, 
right? They don't really need to speak about deep things necessarily. They like to do sports together. They like to fix stuff. They like to go in the backyard to, to I don't know, fix the car, the motorcycle. And, you know, there's something, I don't know, almost primitive about building a bonfire together and sitting there and watching it burn and watching the sparks and just watching the flames and, and hearing the crackling of the sparks just side by side and telling stories, maybe ghost stories. We used to do that as kids. But when you get older, you begin to lose all that. And I would suggest that the Holy Spirit is that fire that draws us together in unity. The Father is the one who has like a purpose for us, a broader universal providence for us, God the Father. And the Son is our model and our, our friend who gives himself to us. And in some senses is like that. He is side by side with us. And he's the one who sends out the apostles with the power of the Holy Spirit, who is always with them. So I would say that if we want to give ourselves more to others, to those in our family, in our work, in our community. Maybe we can, in order to be better live this, this beautiful solemnity, maybe we could try to distinguish when each person is dealing with us. When each person of the Blessed Trinity, like we can say, you know, right now I need more fortitude, so help me to follow the example of our Lord who spoke clearly. I need more fortitude to speak clearly to this friend of mine. Or maybe right now I need openness to the grace of the Holy Spirit to make me more calm or more serene in front of the temptation maybe to anger or to getting upset about something. Or maybe I'm stressed and nervous, so therefore I need a deeper sense of abandonment to God the Father's providence and not get so worried about the future. That's different. One is the Father, that's the, that's the Father. Another one is the, the, the Holy Spirit for inspiration. Another one is the Son for example. Lord, Lord, as we look at you here in the tabernacle, we know that you said, I am always with you. And we have to pick up the different ways in which that is true, in which he is always with us. God is really a Father, and he sent the Son and he and there is really a love between the two that makes that sending real and makes that remaining real because God the Father sent the Son and the Son said, I will be with you always. If we don't have that deep sense of relation with God the Father and we feel ourselves a son, something precarious happens in our life. I don't know if you're aware, but uh, Father Jacques Philippe recently wrote a book about fatherhood and especially how it is applied to priests. So I immediately picked it up. I always like reading the books of uh, Jacques Philippe and now you can, you can download them on Kindle. It's very useful. And it's a beautiful book. I, I've only just begun it. But he talks about the absence of the father figure that God himself, of course, the absence of God, the Father himself, uh, but also other fathers in one way or another in our society today. And uh, our, that is our human versions of uh, divine paternity. And he says, this absence of the father figure causes all kinds of painful consequences in people's lives. All kinds of consequences. And we know that already in many ways. But I was fascinated by at least two ideas that he mentioned. And one is that he said that without fatherhood, without fatherhood, he said, there is a transmission problem. Because the role of the father is to inscribe a child into a lineage, okay? into a lineage, giving access to a heritage. A heritage that the child must later, in turn, transmit to others. It's a question of transmission, and we know how difficult it is already today to transmit from one generation to the next everything that makes up the richness 
uh, and beauty of existence. It's like we have a richness in our own experience and we, we want to transmit that to the next generation. And whether there are human values or spiritual values, cultural values, like language and, and family traditions, yeah. traditions of belonging to a country, to a culture, and so many other things. Those are, it, it's painful to lose the transmission of those values. And what he says is that the lack of a, a paternal role makes this uh, transmission more difficult. And we notice this uh, in uh, the, the shortcoming produ- that, that, that this shortcoming produces um, a certain type of personality. A certain type of personality. That is, the individual who has no awareness of what is owed to him or to those, neither to those who came before nor to what he owes to those coming after. If you have no sense of transmission, no sense of paternity, you don't look behind you what, how you got to be who you are now, nor do you look at the responsibility you have for those coming after you. Without gratitude for the past, without responsibility to others for the future, that person, well, will be content to profit from a life of maximum selfish pleasure, individualistic uh, attainments. And uh, that kind of attitude that we see, well, it's not rare today. It's not rare. So that's the first thing that the lack of fatherhood today brings. It's, It's a problem of transmission. And what we have received, we have received from our Father, right? And our very existence we have received in, in, a, in a mysterious way from God the Father, who wants us to exist, who wants us to exist. And in His providence, He has put us in a certain family, certain country, a certain area, and He's allowed for a certain amount of suffering for us, to be born in a certain way. And, and if we understand that, but God loves me, He has a plan for me. (laughs) It makes our sense of gratitude deeper and want to transmit a sense of meaning also to those who come after us. The second point is that without fatherhood, there's actually no mercy. The modern world believed it it was good to proclaim, he says, the, the death of God, and it exceeded and accepted this great lie of atheism, and the, it was said that by his laws and his commandments, God supposedly prevents man from being free, and he must therefore get rid of commandments. And then the human person will be free and happy to do whatever he wants, without, con- without constraints and without guilt, right? So, now even though this is a lie to millions uh, seen in the millions of deaths and the gulags and so forth, the temptation both to make God and all forms of paternity the enemy of human freedom and consider all kind of verticality as an oppression, all that temptation still exists today. It persists. But things aren't as simple as these atheists suppose. Because if there's no God, there's no mercy. And perhaps... Perhaps the best example he gives is the example of the story of the prodigal son. A son, a, uh, it's one of the most beautiful accounts in the whole gospel uh, narrative in St. Luke. One of the most beautiful stories, right? which gives us a marvelous image of divine paternity. And we all recognize the story of the younger son, well, the two brothers and the younger one, who claimed his inheritance Right? And he went off to a foreign land with his own inheritance, which he got from his father. Right? And as we know, we know the story. After everything was spent in a life of disorder, he found himself watching the pigs. Not particularly uh, a success story for uh, anybody of Jewish family. 
He's dying of hungry, hunger rather, envying the very swine in front of him. And that situation led him to self, a self-reflection and he resolved to go back to his father's house where he came from. And we know he prepared a little speech. He thought, well, the servants are more abundantly fed than I am here. So he said, when I arrive, this is the speech I'll say. I'll say, Father, I have sinned against heaven before you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me as one of your hired hands. That's what I'll say. And we all know exactly the kind of unexpected ending of the story. Like he's not even able to say that speech that he has memorized. Because when he's still a long way off, his father goes running out to him and, and just covers him in kisses. St. Josemaria said he just ate him in kisses. Just, just ate him in kisses. And without even giving him time to speak, he gives the orders to the servants to, to bring suitable clothing, to replace all these ragged clothes that he, that he has. Put a ring on his finger, which is a sign of a regained dignity. Put sandals on those smelly feet and prepare a big party with uh, the fattened calf and the music and that. So just the joy of coming back to the Father's house. We all know that. We all know that story. And it's, it's hard to go through it without being moved again. But he said, now let's imagine that story again, but this time, eliminate the father. Eliminate the father. So now, when the son does come back, there's nobody there. The house is empty. Hopelessly empty, abandoned. The wind beats against the doors of the window. There's nobody to welcome him. No one to pardon him. No one to love him. No one to tell him, in spite of what you've done, in spite of your errors, in spite of all your sin, you remain my well-beloved son. No, he's not there. Father's not there. Imagine that. He doesn't even, he's not there to be able to tell him you can regain your dignity. You know, we, we can't forgive ourselves. We need somebody to give, to forgive us. You know, psychologists speak about you have to forgive yourself. And I suppose there's some truth to that. I suppose, I mean, nothing against psychologists, that's, that's good. But, but in the end, the Father, God the Father has to forgive us. And what power there is in the priest's hands... And in his words, when he says in confession to a penitent, I absolve you from your sins in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. You know, in the name of the Trinity. That power to forgive sins, to bring somebody back. But I can't, like, if I was on a desert island, me, even as a priest, I couldn't, like, absolve myself. Like, it doesn't work. It's, I mean, I'll, I'll ask forgiveness, and then when I die of hunger or whatever, but... but and I hope that God would forgive me. Right? But what power God has given to priests. And, and we are living in a kind of paradox of, of a society that on one hand is very lax and permissive, and, and yet on the other hand, absolutely without mercy for mistakes. The cancel culture that we see, somebody tweeted some, something years ago, and they are canceled. They are destroyed. Their career is over. But in the kingdom of heaven, it's exactly the reverse. Exactly the opposite. There's both a strong moral code and strong moral demands that we live a certain sort of level of virtue and, and, and moral rectitude, a correct path of life, you could say. But at the same time, there's great mercy. If we make a mistake, we can always begin Again, start over. Renewal in the case of error or, or sin. That's because God is truly a community of love. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So let us not just think about the theory of this truth, but let us experience it in God the Father's providence. 
the inspiration of the Holy Spirit always next to us, and of course, the, the model of Jesus Christ as our friend, as our model, always close to us. I am with you always, he said, until the end of the age. And some there, somewhere in there, we have our Blessed Mother, who will also help us. She always looks over us here in this beautiful chapel. Let's ask her for her intercession that she help us to be fully aware of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. I thank you, my God, for the good resolutions, affections, and inspirations you've communicated to me. In this meditation, I ask your help to put them into effect. My Immaculate Mother, St. Joseph, my Father and Lord, my guardian angel intercede for me.